Hi everyone and welcome to another month in review. If you're not familiar with this series, this is where I take a look at all the new to me games I played during the previous month and I rank them from my least favourite all the way up to my most favourite. I have 20 new games that I've played this month and as always they are ranging from Featherlight all the way up to some pretty heavy crunchy Euros and of course everything in between and also as always we have some games going all the way back to the 90s and all the way up to 2021 so we've got a big range of games here and before I get into these games I want to give a shout out to the show's sponsor kienda.co.uk who are my go-to online retailer in the UK so if you live in the UK and you regularly purchase board games then be sure to check out their website because they offer some fantastic loyalty schemes and if you use my discount code in the show notes you can get 5% off your first order. But without further ado, let's get started with the games. So at number 20, I have Mouse, Cheese, Cat, Cucumber, which is a pretty unknown tiny box game. Um, and this is like an abstract hidden role style game as each player has a different role. Um, someone's going to be the mouse, someone's going to be the cat, someone's going to be the, um, the cucumber and so on. And all of them have a different objective of what they're trying to achieve. So for example, the, the mouse wants to get to the cheese, uh, the cat wants to get to the mouse. I think the cucumber wants to keep the cat and the mouse separated. Um, and you're going to do that by laying out these um, these cards, or these square these square cards. And as the, these cards are laid out, they're going to start creating corridors and things. Um, and you're going to be trying to manipulate that to suit yourself and trying to you know achieve your objective. Now, I kind of tend to find these styles of games quite frustrating because whatever you do, somebody else just on their terms ends up undoing. And it's like constant back and forth and nobody really feels like you're getting anywhere. And that's how I felt with this game, really. I find it a bit grating, a bit frustrating, um, and I don't really get a lot from it. So unfortunately, not a recommendation for me, and I just found it a bit, yeah, a bit bit too much of a, of a stalemate from start to finish. At number 19, I have Tiny Epic Galaxies. So unfortunately, this game has not been the one to kind of change my mind on the Tiny Epic series. Um, I just can't seem to understand why these games are so popular. I just don't really get much from them. Um, but this one, to be fair, I think this one is probably the most appropriate for the style of game. You know, all the components feel adequate and appropriate for the game, which is something I don't feel for a lot of the other um, designs. And I know this one is probably considered one of the best ones. And again, I can understand why. So this is a very simple kind of dice-driven game as you're sending out your spaceships to these different um, planets. You can kind of use the benefits from those planets, or you can try and colonize them and build, basically build up an engine of cards as the game goes on. It's got some, some player interaction in terms of racing to get these colonised and piggybacking off other players' actions. But ultimately, I found the game a bit too paint-by-numbers, kind of going through the motions and just seeing what happens and by rolling those dice. At number 18, I have Spike, which is a train game. Uh, this one, at the start of the game, you're going to get given a bunch of objectives where you're going to get a bunch of goods and your, your goal for the game is to deliver those goods to different places. But you also have a another kind of mission card where you want to hit these certain cities. And essentially what you're doing is you're laying out track, you're moving your train along, visiting different cities. And when you visit certain cities at different times, then you can get more points for doing so because it's the kind of supply and demand market where the longer things are neglected and those cities have been ignored, then they're going to kind of slowly creep to the top of that demand and then you'll start getting points accordingly and it'll reset that demand to the bottom. And that I found a bit too lucky and a bit too swingy because sometimes things will just work out just, just through um, pure luck really on what you're just passing at that time. Um, and additionally, this was one of those games where at the start of the game you could have a look exactly what you need to do. You know, I need to hit this city, this city, this city. That's what I'm going to commit to. That's what I'm going to do for my whole game. And then the rest of the game is basically, basically just trying to catch up with that. So you're just going through the motions every single time, going on your pre-planned route. And the game doesn't move as quickly as your mind does. So it ends up feeling slow, plodding, and to be honest, quite boring. Additionally, another negative for this game was that the production itself did get in the way of the um, kind of enjoyment I got from the experience. The pieces are all very cheap, very, um, you know, very light and flimsy. Uh, they kind of fly around the board, they're hard to manipulate. And just the way the um, the trains actually fit on these tracks, it just doesn't quite feel right. And it just feels like it's, you know, made for a very low cost, very low quality um, product. At number 17, I have Knight of the Ninja, which is a pretty rapid social deduction style game. So at the start of this game, everyone is going to get a roll card and that's going to either be in the Lotus Clan, it's going to be in the um, Crane Clan or the Ronin, which is basically a wild card. And then you want to be on the team that's going to survive until the end, or if everybody survives, you want to be the highest ranking team. Um, but the difference with this game is that your powers aren't associated to your roll card. You actually draft the cards or the powers that you're going to use 
throughout the game. And these can be things such as looking at other players' you know, house cards, um, looking at the powers they can use, stealing points from them, or even just eliminating them outright. And that's kind of where the game fell for me, because although this game is really quick and the rounds take, you know, five minutes, if that, you can often get eliminated from this game with having nothing to do about it. You, know, you cannot stop people from doing it. They're going to just choose you, sometimes at pure, you know, a pure hunch, and eliminate you from the round, and you can do nothing about it before your powers are resolved. And that can become a bit grating, and you feel a bit powerless at times. And I don't really tend to enjoy that style of gameplay, especially when it happens again and again and again. Um, and I also thought that the dipping into the bag was a bit of an unsatisfying way to uh, dish out points. And it just wasn't, it just wasn't quite uh, up to the standards of some of the social deduction greats. So it felt like a bit of a, almost like a bit of a regress from me, uh, for me in terms of social deduction games. So can't really recommend it, but it wasn't bad. At number 16, I have Pagan, which is actually a, a hot game at the moment. So this is a head-to-head -head asymmetric almost deduction style game as one player is going to be the witch and one person is going to be the witch hunter. Now the witch knows which character on this um, on this row of characters that they need to cast a spell on but the witch hunter does not know which character that is but they have to try and deduce who that is to try and kill them before the witch casts that spell. And the whole game is played out through this card system where you are building up energy, playing these cards to make things more difficult for your opponents. Um, you know, gaining out more abilities and a bit of an engine as the game goes on. A lot of back and forth in this game, you know, stopping your opponent and things. Um, and I thought this game does have some pretty big issues, although the concept is, is pretty cool. You know, I love the idea of it. But the thing I found wrong with this game or problematic with this game is that if you are the witch hunter, you have a pretty good shot of winning just out of taking a, a lucky shot and getting, you know, winning that way. And that did happen in the game that I played. Um, because I think you only start with, say, 10 characters in the row to, st to start with. There might even be less than that. And you have three chances to kill these characters. So before you even start, you've got like a 25 to 30 percent chance of taking a lucky shot. And you only have to eliminate a few cards by taking this, you know, deduction um, ability by removing cards from the stack and knowing conclusively who the character is not going to be who you're trying to kill. Then those odds get squeezed further and further. And I got to a point where I thought, you know what? There's a there's a 40 to 50 percent chance I can win this game just by taking a lucky shot, and that did happen. And when that happens, it feels very anticlimactic, and it feels like all the build up to that point just felt a bit worthless. So unfortunately, although I like the concept and I think a lot of people will enjoy this game, I couldn't really get that out of my head, and I don't really see myself going back to this one or playing it any further for that reason. At number 15, I have Black Fleet, which is a pretty chaotic pirate themed game and with some pick up and deliver as well. So you are going to be a, a pirate or have two pirate ships of your color. You are going to be sailing around trying to eliminate the other players pirate ships and stealing their delivery cubes. And you're also trying to pick up cubes from your merchant ship and deliver them to these different ports to get coins. Um, you're unlocking these abilities as you go to make yourself better at everything basically. I mean, you know, moving faster, fighting better, um, and even manipulating these kind of neutral naval ships to screw with other players. That's pretty much what this game has to offer. It's very much a luck fest, very chaotic, certainly a family weight game. Um, but I think if in the right situation, this one could be one that I'd play. Um, it's certainly nothing too taxing. And again, if you want something just without thinking too much and just want to embrace some of the carnage, then, you know, Black Fleet could be an option. At number 14, I have Sonora, which is a pretty unique concept uh, for a game. So this is a, a dexterity game mixed with almost like a, a roll and write or flip and write style game. But of course, you are not rolling dice or revealing cards. You are flicking a disc on this player board. Wherever your discs land, you will take the corresponding actions um, wh where it landed. And that's going to be a different mini game on your player sheet. And they're all very simple things such as a polyomino game or trying to fill up these um, different shapes um, with, with dots and if you do the fastest you get more points than people who do it after you. So really simple straightforward mini games there. Um, I can't help but feel this game was a massive wasted opportunity because again I don't think any other game did this um, did this concept until Sonora did but I just thought that the flicking was too easy. You, know, you could easily flick it to the one you wanted it to be um, and additionally, everybody would have a different setup where they start their discs on a different kind of part of the board. And you're not actually allowed to flick it straight onto the region in front of you. You'd have to ricochet it back. And it almost wasn't worth the effort to do that. So one of the spaces always got neglected more than the other ones did. And it just, again, it just felt like it was, it just felt like it didn't reach its potential. And it could have been so much more 
to fully embrace that dexterity side of things. Just, so unfortunately, just slightly missed the mark for me, but I would play this one because it's pretty quick, and you know, the, the actual game itself was fine. So that is Sonora. At number 13, I have First and Roll, which is certainly the biggest surprise for me um, of the month. I was not expecting to get anything from this game because I have no emotional connection or interest in American football or sports games in general. Um, but this one, you know what, it works surprisingly well. And if you are a fan of the you know, American football, then I'm pretty sure you will like this game or at least get some enjoyment from it because it is very well executed and the thematics are tied to the gameplay mechanisms very well. So this is a dice rolling and simultaneous selection, always bluffing style game where of course you're trying to score touchdowns and field goals. And you're gonna do that by revealing dice simultaneously where one person's gonna be obviously the offensive team, one's gonna be the defensive team. And then you've got three tiers of dice as well. So you've got like the really long range ones, you've got the mid range ones, and you've got the short range ones. Um, and you can really kind of cover a lot of ground if you end up choosing the long range one and your opponent doesn't. Um, you can get intercepted. Uh, you've got some kind of pushy like mechanisms going on. You've got to get everything done and take bigger risks before the time runs out. So it seemed to have all the areas covered and what it needed to without being too bloated or convoluted and just staying true to its core self. So for that, I had to give it some praise and hence why it came a respectable 13, um, my 13th best game uh, of the month. So that is first and roll. At number 12, I have Bear Raid, which is certainly uh, a disappointing uh, ranking for me because I was expecting to love this game. Uh, so this is a Ryan Courtney design who's known for Curious Cargo and Pipeline. Um, and it's another economic game. This one's more of a stocks and share style game that's relatively simple in terms of rules. However, those rules are very um, unintuitive. It's quite a clunky game in the way it works and the way that things are kind of ordered. So this one, you are, as you'd expect, trying to buy low, sell high. Um, you can be pretty spiteful in this game as well as if people are really investing in a certain company, you can end up just kind of tanking the stock from that, from that company and making all their shares worth nothing, essentially, um, which didn't quite sit right for me. But it seemed for me like it was, very, it was a very difficult game for people to wrap their heads around. And by the time it did click, it almost seemed to have lost them. And it was kind of an uphill battle from there. So I thought that the maybe the fun factor wasn't quite there, maybe it was trying to be a bit too clever and ultimately for me now I'm not willing to take that gamble and that ex put in that extra work or put my game group through that extra work in order to get a payoff in the end. I need it to be good from the get-go whereas this one isn't quite that experience. So not quite right for my game group and to be honest you complete transparency, transparency I've only played this game once and that once was enough for me. So it's not a condemnation on the game because I didn't give it a fair shot, but I just know from that first play it's not right for me. At number 11, I have another relative disappointment, you know, despite ranking respectably at 11. Uh, this is Zapotec, which was definitely one of my most anticipated games for 2021 or, or 2022, I suppose. Um, this is the latest board in dice um, game, which is a kind of a sister game to the T series. Now I'm talking um, Solkin, Teotihuacan, Wakanta, Kenyu, uh, those games. However, this one is not a Daniele Tashini design. This is from Fabio Lopiano, um, who designed games such as Merv and Kalamala. And this is actually a really quick Euro game. I suppose you can call it a, almost like a simultaneous selection, area majority style game, area control. Um, as you are playing these cards out, and these cards are kind of the pivotal focus of the game because they're gonna decide the initiative order, which is a really strong factor in the game. It's gonna show the regions you can build in, and it's also gonna show the resources that you get because as the game goes on and you're building more things, you're building up your player board, which means you can get more and more resources the more you trigger those rows or columns. Now the game only plays out over five rounds, which is not a lot of time to get things done. But what I found in this game was that the the effort you had to put in to map out the resources you needed became a bit too much of a chore where you ended up just triggering your strongest row again and again and again and just building whatever you could um, because it's not really worth spending all that extra brain power just to get an extra building down. It left me feeling uninspired. I wasn't thinking, you know, this is a, a brilliant, innovative new game. Um, I was really looking forward to it being so quick, but still crunchy. And Ultimately, I felt I left the game feeling, no, I don't really need to play this much more. I get it, and it's not as good as the other games in the series. And I think maybe the, the thing that people are really latching onto with this game is the fact that it does play in around an hour, which is, of course, a big achievement. 
but I would rather pay that extra 30 minutes and get a much richer experience from that. At number 10, I have some silly fun with Pick Picnic or Hick Hack in Gakawak. So this is a very light, little simultaneous selection game as you have a hand of cards um, with all these different birds on them, um, all these foxes on them. And as the game is set up, you're gonna have these six different boards all corresponding to a um, suit of cards. And these different cubes are gonna build up on these different sections as the game goes on representing, I suppose like breadcrumbs or something. Um, and they're also gonna come in three different denominations, like one point ones, two points, and three points. And then all you're gonna do, uh, simultaneously with other players, you're gonna select a card, reveal it, and then if you're the only chicken to go to a region, then you're going to get all the um, points cubes on that. If you've shared a spot with another chicken, then you have a bit of a fight off or you can negotiate to how those um, cubes are going to get divided. Um, or if a fox has gone to a spot where another chicken is, then you eat all the chickens and all the chickens have point values assigned to them. So it's got that kind of, you know, thinking what your opponents are going to do, trying to counteract that. Maybe, you know, going here when they thought you were going to go there, that kind of thing. Very quick, very simple. I'm talking, you know, this is like a one out of five in terms of the weight, but it works for what it is. And it's a nice little filler game that caters up to six players well. And I like it. You know, it's staying in my collection for now. And if I want that, you can just switch your brain off and just have a bit of chaotic fun. Then, um, then this is another example of, you know, a, a good game that fits that niche. So that is Hick Hack and Gakawak. At number nine, I have Ares Expedition, which is the card game version of Terraforming Mars. Now, to be completely honest, I've never played Terraforming Mars, so I can't compare the two to say which one's better. However, I think this game is um, rightly compared to a game called Race for the Galaxy, um, clearly being inspired by that game, which is you know, fair play to them. It's a very good design. And this one uses the basically a carbon copy of the role selection or action selection system, where if you select a card, you will uh, get that action at an improved version, but everybody else will also get to do that action. So you need to know what people are gonna choose really, because you can probably choose something else. Um, and then you're basically building up an engine of cards, getting more efficient as the game goes on, um, trading these um, different resources in to get points. Um, some of these cards have additions on them. They're all gonna be constantly improvements on what you're doing throughout the game. Quite a satisfying experience, it plays in a relatively succinct amount of time. A pretty clever card play as well, and I liked it. I do put it pretty much shoulder to shoulder with Race for the Galaxy. I think this game does improve it in respect of the user interface and the kind of production because it's a bit cleaner in terms of its symbology and things to make it a bit easier to get to the table. And I also thought that the player boards in the game were very well designed because you could just look at a glance at what you could do. Now, I'll be honest, I wasn't blown away with it. I would play this one, I would play this one if it was suggested to me and if somebody else really wanted to play it. But I thought it was just fine. I thought it was a, a good design, but it didn't really leave me excited. And there's other engine builders that I'd prefer over this one. But no criticism of the game. It works well for what it does. So that is Ares Expedition. At number eight, I have the quest for El Dorado, which is a Reiner Knizia deck building racing game, which is quite a cool little um, hybrid of things there. So this game, you are building up a deck of cards, of course, as the game goes on. And all, the car all these cards have ways of navigating the terrain on this kind of modular board as the game goes on. You're gonna be fighting through forestry, sailing down rivers, and kind of visiting your way through these camps and things, and collecting bonuses as you go. And just being the, trying to be the most efficient and quickest to do that by buying new cards, which will give you better ben benefits and make you um, stronger in terms of fighting through forests and things. So I love the um, I love the idea of this game. Another one where the thematics work, and you can kind of get immersed in that. Um, I must admit, there were times in this game, and I, okay, I've only played this once so far. So this is a first impressions review, and I would like to play this one a few times more. Um, the deck building aspect of this game almost worked against it at times because. You could often leave yourself stranded in places and you'd, spend up, you'd end up spending your coins to buy the cards to counteract or to get through the next kind of river you need to get through, whatever. Um, but you might end up keep drawing cards that are not for that. So you end up buying things and you have to go through all your deck again and again and again, just discarding cards on your turn, not getting much done before you can finally move. And if it works out for somebody else, then they might already have quite a big jump on you before you can start making that ground back up. Now, that is, again, a completely um, first play observation. Maybe I was doing something wrong, I don't know, but it seemed to me that the shuffle of the cards 
could drastically affect your gameplay. Now, I'm not massively bothered by that because this is a you know, 30 to 45 minute game. Which, um, I'd like to try some more of the cards and see how they work and things because I didn't really get to do much on my, on my game. Um, but yeah, I think this has potential to either sit where it is or maybe climb a bit higher. But at number seven, I have the Trails of Tukana, which is another very simple flip and write style game. And this is a route building game, as all you're doing is connecting these terrains together, trying to um, make a trail back to these starting villages and generate a bit of a point engine. So turn, kind of the turn sequence could be more simple, just flip two cards, which each have a terrain on, and then draw a line in between those two terrains, which are basically these hexes, and, um, and then move on to the next one, basically. There's some public objections you want to race to. Um, I love the way that the points work in this game, where at the end of each round you score for what you've already ticked off and connected back to your starting towns, meaning that if you kind of, kind of get off the um, starting point early, you can start generating things multiple times or scoring things multiple times. And I like the way in this game as well, where um, towards the end of the game, there'll suddenly be one or two lines that you draw, which will just connect a huge network together and then you start really getting the big points. Um, I liked it. It's certainly um, a quality roll and write or flip and write style game that I would recommend, especially because it plays in about 15 minutes, which is um, even more impressive. At number six, I have Gutenberg, um, which is another one of my most anticipated games from 2021. Now, this is a pretty simple contract fulfillment style game. However, you can complete contracts at two levels. You've got that kind of basic level and you've got the more kind of advanced versions where you have to trade in extra resources or climb um, up on additional tracks to get even more points or money or income or new contracts. And this game is all based on the kind of early days of the printing industry. And you are collecting inks, you're trying to um, improve your disciplines on all these different kind of printing disciplines, I suppose. Um, you're collecting all these different types, which are all these different letters to fulfill these contracts. Um, but the thing I liked most about this game was this initiative system where before anything is resolved, you will secretly allocate all these different cubes on your player board. And the more you allocate to a certain action means that you'll go there quicker. So again, if you've bid four on, say, taking a new contract, your opponent's bid three, then you will go first and get what you really want. So I thought the actual gameplay itself was a bit lackluster, to be honest. Now, obviously I like it because it's come, come high on the list, but the thing that really did make me enjoy it more was that initiative system. I think without that, the game would feel pretty bland, to be honest, but sometimes that extra twist on things is all you need. Now, I'm not saying I love this game and it did fall below what I was expecting from it, still a decent game. I think this is a, something to consider if you want to kind of dip your toe into Euro games, but not bite off too much. At number five, I have the Guild of Merchant Explorers. And now this game actually shares a lot of DNA with a game like The Trails of Tucana, where you are drawing um, these two terrains, basically, or actually, in fact, you're drawing a card in this one, which is going to show which terrain type you can put your cubes on. Now, you're going to start in this basic area in the middle, and you're going to keep spreading out. Um, as you spread out, you can establish new areas to start and spawn from. Um, you can collect these, uh, visit these towers to get a big bunch of points. You can visit coins as you go on the way. You can connect these cities together to get a bunch of points. So there's tons of ways to generate points. Uh, but the thing that's coolest about this game is that every round you're going to take a new uh, one of these special cards which will give you a really powerful ability such as maybe going as far as you want on the sea but in a straight line or be, being able to fill in a complete area with that single card. And these feel fantastic when they are pulled from that deck and you kind of want them all. So I, I think that's definitely the kind of unique selling point from this game is those special cards. Now, I did have a few issues with this game and I have only played this one twice. I played on two of the maps and I want to play it on at least all four of them before I give my final verdict, really. Um, I thought that this game was quite fiddly and I mean physically fiddly because the maps that you play on are, aren't very big. And with every every card you draw, you're placing a number of cubes on these um, little hexes and it starts getting more and more cluttered. And even then you're removing um, cubes and putting your little huts on there or you're putting these little treasure chest tokens down. It just becomes a bit too much and everything feels a bit too small and precise. And if you have big fingers or big hands, you can kind of knock things and it just becomes a bit too much. And so that for me actually works against the game. And I don't quite see why this couldn't have been a pure you know, dry erase kind of style game and you just leave things that you need to leave on there by ticking it off, for example, rather than leaving a little cardboard chit on there. Um, so I'm not quite sure why they went that direction. It could have easily been, you know, a fraction of the cost if they just did a, a dry erase sheet and some pens. But the gameplay itself is certainly solid. It's engaging, it's fun, and it's a satisfying experience, which is good. 
So again, I'll kind of on that borderline of is it going to be a shield of quality? I'm not quite sure. But as of now, that is completely in the air. So that is the Guild of Merchant Explorers. Okay, so my top four games are where my shield of qualities begin. So these are recommendations from me. So at number four is Fleet the Dice Game. So I've been after this game for a long, long time. We finally got a copy and I have to say, I'm very happy to say that this game certainly lived up to my expectations I had from it. Very clever design here um, and it's a roll and write game. So I don't know what it is at the moment. I seem to be playing a lot of roll and write style games, um, but I'm sure that will pass relatively quickly. So this one, you have these custom dice um, and you're going to play in multiple phases. And the first one is going to be drafting these, um, these fish or crabs or um, oyster dice and ticking off on these rows and columns corresponding to those dice. And as you go down, you're going to be unlocking new powers. You're going to be unlocking these fishing vessels or these boats, which means when it comes to a fishing phase, you can start filling up the boats with, with fish, which are going to be victory points at the end. Um, you have a bunch of different upgrades and unlocks as you can do that you can focus on by um, selecting other dice or drafting other dice in the kind of building phase. And I love what all these different things do. You know, you can kind of get overspill vessels or you can get pure points or you can kind of have this seafood buffet where instead of using this action, you can use the fish here, which will um, score you points on a sliding scale, depending on how many of these fish you have. Not the easiest game to explain because there's quite a lot going on and a lot of things work with each other. And there's also that ability to combo things together or create those chain reactions, um, which is great, which is certainly what you want from a World of Might style game. However, it can become a bit taxing at times to remember what you've done and what you've still got left to resolve. But not too much work if you're used to this kind of thing. I liked it, I need to play it some more, and you know what, I'm impressed. So that is Fleet the Dice Game. At number three, I have Condottieri. Now this game really did impress me. I wasn't quite sure what to expect from reading the rules, um, but this is a very simple, almost filler um, area control style game. Um, however, there is certainly a lot of nuance, a lot of um, hidden depth here, as you have a hand of cards, and these cards are going to come in two types. You've got like these mercenary cards, which are basically strength cards, but you also have all these special ability cards as well. Now, all you do on a player's turn is they're going to select a region to fight over, and then in turn you're going to either play a card or you're going to pass. But what I love about this game is the way you have to manage your hand of cards because you have a very limited amount and you do not draw back or do not draw any cards back into your hand until certain things happen in the game. So you can actually end up having to spread these cards out over multiple battles. So you can't commit too much, but you still, of course, want to win some stuff and you have to know when to hold back and when to push because you can even get caught off guard, end up hoarding all your good cards, but be forced to discard them later. And the way that these special cards are resolved are fascinating. Like you can render all the powerful cards as, as strength one if you want to. You can kind of bluff by playing strong cards out and then withdrawing them by playing these scarecrow cards. Just a lot of things, different pathways, pathways you can take here. And the scoring system as well is great because you either need to control five regions or three adjacent regions, which means that there's sometimes battles that come up that are just must win battles. And that's when the, the head games and the bluffing and the, um, yeah, just the, the card play really comes to life. So massively impressed with this one. We played, played it back to back because, again, it's one of those games where you want to play a few times just to understand how it works. And I can certainly see this one climbing for me because it's one of those games where if you play it with the same group again and again and again, instead of getting boring, it will actually get better and that meta game will start to develop. Okay, so I actually have two games that have earned my Elite Shield this month, which is quite a rare thing to happen. Sometimes I don't get any, but having two certainly is a treat. At number two, I have Messina 1347, which is the latest game from Vladimir Suki. And this game has all the things I've come to love from Suki games, such as, you know, the, the chain reactions, the combos, all the ways to score points. Yeah, this game exactly delivered what I wanted. And on top of that, the theme itself, the whole Black Death thing, really does help um, make the rules resonate with the players and make, make it stick in your mind because everything makes sense in this game. So essentially you're gonna be sending off your workers onto this um, map on the board, which is a big kind of modular hex grid. Uh, but instead of uh, a standard worker placement game where you can go wherever you want, you can only go to adjacent regions, um, but you can spend a call coins to go further. You are then resolving the actions, such as you know, gaining more resources to help you build buildings, to get, get your points. Uh, but you're also fighting off these play cubes 
And as you fight off these play cubes, your reputation is going to grow. Um, if you don't fight them off, you're going to end up accruing negative points. You are rescuing these civilians from the town. If they've come in contact with the plague, then they go into quarantine, which normally means they're unproductive, but you can make them productive by buying other buildings. So a ton of things going on here. Um, different paths to victory. You can try and repopulate the city. Um, just an absolute joy to play. I, I think this game is a blast. If you play with two players, it's ultra quick. I'm talking about 60 to 70 minutes, which is so impressive with a game with this much to think about. And you know what? I absolutely loved it. But despite my love for Messina 1347, my number one is Russian Railroads. So this game really did kind of take me by surprise. Now, of course, I was wanting to play this game because of its reputation over the years, certainly regarded as one of the best worker placement games. And that's true. I can't think of many worker placement games that are better than this one and feel like this one because this is really a game that scores unlike anything else and it's a very high scoring game where you're completely showered in points especially as the game goes on you could end up getting like nearly 100 points if not over 100 points per round which is you know obviously quite hefty um but i just love the tenseness of wanting to do everything in this game i love the player boards and just all the different mechanisms in how you can score points as you're trying to push these train tracks up these um different tracks that you have on your player board but as the game goes on, you want to push the kind of more quality train track up there because they start scoring you more and more points. You can get more suppliers on them. You can unlock more meeples to give you more actions. You can build up your little industry board and move another token up to get you more victory points and benefits as you go up. You have to spin lots of plates because you can move up these tracks, but you don't score from these tracks unless you spend time investing in these trains to make you score from those tracks. You can get personal worker placement spots. And it's so much going on here that I was just absolutely in my element and I adore this game and I've only played the Russian Railroads one at the moment I've got the Ultimate Railroads um, box set so I'm so excited to try some of the additional content but you know what if I just had the Russian Railroads game I would be more than satisfied everything feels good in this game and it is just such a blast to play and relatively easy and straightforward as well considering how much depth there is to this one I can see this one ranking extremely high on my top 100 this year and it might even have potential to be my new to me game of the year because it is that good so that is Russian Railroads at number one so there we have it those are my 20 new to me board games I played during the month of June 2022 had some really amazing games uh, this month if you have enjoyed the video please be sure to hit like and subscribe to my channel Additionally, if you want to go that extra step, I do have a Patreon campaign where you can financially support the channel and keep it going because, you know, making content like this is not cheap. Um, so as always, I really appreciate anybody new supporting the channel and a massive thank you to my existing uh, patrons as well. But for everybody else, I'll see you next time on Chairman of the Board. Bye bye.